So by in another one, one and a half hours, one and a half hours, we'll go ahead and see a little bit about uh, prostate and various things about prostate. The commonest are two. One is, you know, benign prostatic hyperplasia and <coughs> carcinoma of the prostate. Next. Now see, all of us have enjoyed this game in the childhood. Hmm? And then they find out who has the highest flow, who can dig the, you know, uh, uh, the biggest hole on the ground, etc., etc. Without realizing, next slide, that sometime in future, we are going to face with problems of urination as the age advances. Now, this is the normal bladder and normal prostate. What you can see here is, you know, this is the bladder which is smooth walled and this is the prostate gland which is normally about 15 to 18 grams. And it is situated between the bladder and the urinary passage or urethra. The function of this prostate gland is to give nourishment to the seminal fluid. The seminal fluid which comes from Testes, there are sperms which are added into it and the fluid comes from seminal vesicles. Some amount of fluid comes from the urethral glands and some amount of fluid comes from the prostatic tissue and that fluid is something which nourishes the seminal fluid, sperms. Next. But as the age advances, what happens is there is benign prostatic hyperplasia, there is enlargement of the prostate gland. So normally we call it benign enlargement of prostate, enlargement of prostate, prostate gland growth, etc. But what happens is prostate consists of three tissues. There is fibrous tissue, there is muscular tissue and there is adenomatous tissue. So whenever we are talking about benign prostatic hyperplasia, it is adenomatous tissue of the prostate gland which increases in size. This is adenomatous tissue and this is you know fibromuscular tissue and that gets compressed and this adenoma increases in size. Next slide. Uh, again, previous one. Obviously, you will see that because of this enlargement, what are the kind of changes we can see? The wall which was thin and smooth has become thickened and irregular. The inner surface which is smooth has become, you know, trabeculated. We call it trabeculated. There are crisscross, you know, hypertrophic submucosal smooth muscle hypertrophy and it causes this kind of saccules, salules and sometimes there are diverticuli, these kind of depressions are there and these are the places where you know urine gets accumulated, infected and obviously if it happens from both the sides, it causes outflow obstruction, urinary outflow obstruction and because of that straining, the muscle gets hypertrophied. Next. Now, the prostate tumor or prostatic enlargement is actually speaking a benign tumor of a male. And the incidence is at the age of 50, almost 30% will have some amount of enlargement of prostate. At the age of 80, almost 75% will have enlargement of prostate. It's a natural history. I mean, it has nothing to do with anything which is related to race, religion, diet, sexual activity, anything. It is a natural history. Like in every female, she is going to have menopause. Similarly, all the males, they are going to have enlargement of the prostate. So, it is a natural history. Race, religion, nationality, diet, etc. This have no influence over the enlargement of this gland. Next. Now, there have been lot of advances. Now, I generally always tell students that, you know, advances of two types. There are some concept which change and that gives some kind of advances. And there is technology, newer and newer technology. There are advances in that. Sometimes, you know, a new concept will give rise to a new technology. And sometimes an existing technology, people think of it and they have a newer concept to treat a disease. So, there are essentially only two types of advances in medical field. One is conceptual advance and second one is technological advance. Next. Now, what happens? We will we'll consider both these conceptual and uh, technological. What happens? We call it nowadays lower urinary tract symptoms. The newer terminology internationally accepted is LUTS. Anybody who has got prostatic symptoms, previously we used to call that this patient has got prostatism, like urinary symptoms, urinary outflow symptoms. But nowadays we call it LUTS. So, LUTs which are associated with benign prostatic hyperplasia, that is lower urinary tract symptoms, they can be divided into essentially two types. One, few of them are widening symptoms and there is obstructive symptoms, like you know there is hesitancy of flow, there is straining, 
there is weak stream, there is terminal dribbling, there is prolonged voiding time. What patient would tell you that I take long time to empty my bladder, there is some amount of dribbling, the stream is very thin, I have to strain, I have to strain with my abdominal muscles and when I go there with a desire to pass urine, I have to wait for a long, there is a hesitancy. And there are some irritative symptoms which can be called as storage symptoms, storage symptom of the bladder and these are widening symptoms. The storage symptoms would be frequency, repeatedly going, urgency, cannot hold urine, we have to rush to the bathroom, nocturia, that is nocturnal frequency, night frequency. Then sometimes there is urge incontinence and every time he is partially emptying the bladder, so there is small volume widening. Next. Now, how do we diagnose it? Simple thing, history taking for symptoms which we discussed, all the symptoms of storage and voiding, both. We have, that is obstructive symptoms and irritative symptoms. So, we have a score which is known as international prosthetic score, IPPS score. So, kind of, you know, like these are the symptoms which you focus on. Abdominal examination, they are all old people, it's an old age disease. So obviously abdominal examination is very important, incidental finding of some kind of a mass in the bladder, mass in the abdomen, some kind of you know liver enlargement, spleen enlargement. So abdominal have lower urinary tract, obstructive, irritative, all kinds of symptoms you operate. Hmm? Next. But this is the most take home, important take home message. Balloon dilatation, I told you, it has gone out of work. They used to have 90 French balloon. Normally catheter which we put in Retention of urine is what size? Anybody knows? Catheter. Suppose patient comes in retention and you are supposed to pass a catheter. So what catheter you will ask for? 16. Correct? 16, 14, 16, 14. So here 90 French catheter is used. Imagine. The atmospheric pressure is 4 atmospheric pressure maintained for 10 minutes. So it's a very ghastly procedure done under anesthesia. Next. And this kind of, you know, like this is the situation. You put a balloon inside you at extremely heavy atmospheric pressure you dilate it and this kind of a situation exists but this reverts back to this within few months next so balloon dilatation you should not even remember about it next these are kind of stents which are put in uh, this is this actually speaking this is a stent which is you know misplaced from here this balloon this flower should be here at this place and this flower should be here and then you know it will give rise to complete urination but there are a lot of problems if this flower comes near you know external sphincter and keeps it open he will have continuous leakage of urine next then came stents now this stent has been put by me for stricture urethra but same kind of stent is sometimes you can imagine this is a fracture pelvis giving rise to stricture and this metallic stent titanium stent has been put so, this same stent can be put in the prostatic urethra in extremely moribund patients. Next, this is just for the sake of information.